Welcome to Kani Conversations, an opportunity to hear from leading experts and their opinions on topics of major current interest in brain science. I am Diane Lipscomb, the director of the Kani Institute for Brain Science and professor of neuroscience at Brown University. I'm joined by my colleague, Chris Moore, the associate director of the Kani Institute and also a professor of neuroscience. And today we're in conversation with our guest and longtime friend, Dr. Stefan McDonough. Today's conversation, how rule breaking and innovation feed new knowledge, has relevance, of course, across a number of dis different disciplines in academia and in industry. While most of us accept the need for innovation and discovery is acute, especially today, and only debated by fringe groups, too little time is devoted to the question of how to create an environment to catalyze innovation. Stefan McDonough has thought a lot about this question, and so we're delighted to be able to talk with him today. Stefan is a Brown graduate of engineering physics, adjunct professor of pharmacology, physiology, and biotechnology at Brown, and on the advisory council of the Kearney Institute for Brain Science. Stefan is currently Executive Director and Head of Emerging Science Genetics at Pfizer. Stefan received his PhD from Caltech and completed his postdoctoral work with Bruce Bean at Harvard Medical School. He was drawn to Amgen in 2003 by deep interest in the mechanism of drug action and, as importantly, the desire to make a difference in the world. Four years ago, Stefan was wooed away by, from Angen by Pfizer. Stefan has initiated and led multiple programs for first in class therapies, including for chronic pain and also target identification for other novel therapies, including in oncology. His many, many accomplishments include leading Angen's genome analysis unit and some of his work on the genetics of schizophrenia is featured in Robert Kolker's book, Hidden Valley Road, which is currently number six on the New York Times bestseller list. Stefan is also a lover of rare books, a little league and special Olympics coach, and he swims very long distances in very cold water for swim across America. He also loves to communicate the wonders and the importance of science. Welcome, Stefan. Thank you. Before, you're welcome. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. And before Chris and I kick off our conversations, I just want to thank you all for being here and to remind you to submit questions through the Q&A feature, which you can find on the lower part of your screen. And Chris and I will get to as many questions as we can within the hour. So Stefan, we all know that innovation is the oxygen that supports knowledge creation and the path to cures and treatments for brain disorders. So let me start by asking you to introduce yourself and to tell us a bit about your interest in innovation and also in rule breaking. Stefan. Well, thank you for a very kind introduction and also thank you for the invite. You're doing wonderful things with the Kearney and it's just a, a great pleasure to be part of them. Um, so as to my background, uh, why innovation? I am in the pharmaceutical industry, of course, and uh, we do have some unique challenges there, particularly in the neurosciences area. Um, nobody, nobody will dispute the opportunity in neurosciences. It, it's kind of interesting when I, when I teach, one of my standard introductions is to say, please raise your hand if you know somebody who has been affected by Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or bipolar or schizophrenia, now keep them up. And by the time you go down all the disorders, everybody has, has all their hands in the air. Well, both hands in the air. So the opportunity is there. And a lot of the emerging biological insights, I think, are going to end up in application with the pharma industry to uh, make new cures, preventives, or uh, we hope cures. It's an area that it's ripe for innovation. Nonetheless, this is an area that large organizations can struggle with uh, for many reasons. Um, you have internal competition, a large organization that has the resources of, of a big pharma company. Um, these resources are not lying idle. 
And so it's very difficult by definition, something that is new, something that is innovative is risky. And so what that means is you're taking in something that is risky that may not work and displacing something that perhaps is on a fairly secure track. Mm -hmm. And that's very hard to do. Uh, it's a unique, it's a challenge for any industry. I think probably General Motors and Saturn is an interesting case. My, my first car was a Saturn and I understand it was so successful that um, that it was ended uh, by some of the other GM divisions. That's probably an oversimplification, but it, it illustrates the point. And large pharma has challenges even beyond that to go with the resources. It's a very long product cycle, um, probably about 15 years between ideation and when something actually reaches patients. Um, and every medicine, it's not, again, going back to the car analogy, it's not like you're inventing a better version of, of the Toyota Camry with every release. Every drug is its own story, every disease is its own story, and every disease has its unexplored biology. So both uh, at Amgen and at Pfizer, and especially in terms of the work I've done with colleagues in venture capital in both institutions, um, you see what works, you see what when and, and what does not work. So I think it's one of the most important, one, one of the most fascinating things that I've learned that I'd really like to hear thoughts on and hope we can discuss is how to organize such that you can bring forth these innovations, make room for them and actually let them flourish. Because on, on any given year, it probably makes the most sense not to invest in something risky. Uh, if you can put in X dollars for Y years and get Z return, this is very appealing. And innovation doesn't work like that. Yet, if you ignore it for 10 years in a row, you're in a very bad spot. So this is kind of where I come from, and I don't know how applicable the lessons that I've learned are to industry in general or to innovation in general, but just so you know, that's sort of the perspective that got me thinking about these. Yeah, that's great. You know, it's, um, we, again, we know inherently, of course, that if you're at the cutting edge of something, there's risk um, inevitably, but how you think about balancing that risk and moving yourself out, perhaps out of the low energy well, where things are working um, and there's that risk of, of tipping the balance into a, a, a dysfunctional <laughs> situation. Um, but but um, finding that balance, and I think we'll get into a, a more of a deeper discussion um, in, in the rest of this hour. But Stefan, um, can you say a little bit more about what is innovation you know, to you? So for example, do you have a personal favorite discovery or an approach that stopped you in your tracks? Hmm. That's something that just stood out as momentous and different from everything else. Like, how do you define innovation, and and how do you know it when you see it? Um, I think what you well, I'll answer the second one first. How do you know it when you see it? The answer to that is you know it when you see it. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll come to this in further discussions, especially when you're trying to say, here is a great idea. How do we turn this into something useful? How do we plot the roadmap to get there? You naturally have to metric that. And what are the metrics that you use to say you are on your process on the, the road to a true breakthrough, in our case, to one that's going to lead to improvements in health in neurological disease? I don't know. It's a very, very tough thing to do especially with such a long product cycle, but the answer, exactly what you said, is a good one. You know it when you see it. Mm -hmm. um, that's about the best answer I can give for that one. This is one that I've spent many sleepless nights on. Okay, I'm in an emerging science and innovation unit. How do you tell you're actually getting somewhere? As soon as you start saying, okay, you have a metric of 10 great ideas per year. Well, I'm gonna give you 10 ideas per year. They may or may not be any good, but I will go start going to the metric. So that's one of the real challenges, I think, for any innovative network. How do you do it? Um, this now has given me a couple of time to think of some of my own personal favorites. Yeah, uh, cystic fibrosis is mm -hmm. one that's personally, I think it's a wonderful story and it resonates personally with me because that's what I did my PhD thesis on. Uh, the gene had just been cloned. This was uh, back in 89 with uh, Lapchi Choi, Francis Collins, and John Reardon from Toronto. And uh, this was done by positional cloning. And there was, it, it's hard to envision today, but yeah, there was a time when not long ago when we didn't know what caused cystic fibrosis. 
So first, just the, the sheer coordination among different groups with different talents and different expertises to get together and solve this problem. And then, of course, you didn't only have the gene responsible, but you had to say, okay, which particular variant causes disease? And then there are, it was found there are multiple variants that could cause multiple forms of disease. Cystic fibrosis, it's an ion channel, a chloride ion channel. Put simply, it's moving salt back and forth by moving chloride back and forth into and out of cells. And some mutations will prevent that channel from getting to its proper place and so give cystic fibrosis. Some, the channel will get to its proper place, just not really conduct chloride very well. So understand not only was the gene discovered, you then had to understand the genotype phenotype relations and then the real technical innovation starts. The cures for this, and I, I don't think it's too bold to say they are now cures from Vertex Pharmaceuticals actually started off in Aurora Biosciences in San Diego using some really innovative screening methodologies where they invented uh, uh, in their entirety fluorescent dyes that would be able to monitor chloride going into and out of cells. Then you actually have sort of a disease in a dish model, create molecules that work in a cell, then extend through the clinical development pipeline. And where we are now, my, my first cousin uh, works in the hospital to see cystic fibrosis patients. And she says, she's just not seeing them anymore because we're done. Well, I shouldn't go that far, but no question, it's been a quantum leap. So this is one that's a personal favorite that I, because you can see from start to finish. Um, the other one I'll think of, it's more ambiguous. Um, and it's, it's not one I have personal familiarity with, but probably the Manhattan Project. And here, uh, uh, my knowledge here, uh, Norman Davidson at Caltech, one of my thesis advisors actually worked on the Manhattan Project. But most of my knowledge comes from Richard Rhodes' book, The Making of the Atomic Bomb. Mm -hmm. And just the thumbs up for that. <laughs> it's a great book. I loved it. I've learned so much. And just, we, we take it for granted, but think of just not only the scientific challenge, but the operational and organizational challenge of bringing together all these disciplines, all the science, the physics, the chemistry, the engineering, and then of course, on a, what today in business terms we'd call a very accelerated timeline. Um, it's an ambiguous legacy to be sure, but, but no question, remarkable, remarkable achievements. Thanks. So you're describing um, a fairly long time course of innovation in, in both these examples and the cystic fibrosis example, I know um, somewhat. Um, so there's not a single moment of, ah, this is innovative, <laughs> but, but a series of, of highly innovative discoveries that, that can traverse a, a pretty long time frame. Yeah, I think that would be my, my instinct, mm -hmm. is that what we can look back on now as a breakthrough, it takes a long time. And uh, with the exception of these very rare moments like Albert Einstein's experiment to see if light could be bent by gravity with looking at stars, by and large, these are the accumulation of many small steps, many false starts, many blind alleys. I can remember back to cystic fibrosis, there was a quite a quite a, a, a hot debate over what this channel actually did. And maybe it wasn't a chloride channel, maybe it had some mm -hmm. other function. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult. There's very seldom a single aha moment and mm -hmm. it takes a lot of time in particular in my field for the time to go from initial discovery to new therapeutic that actually delivers the promise. It's about 25 years mm -hmm. and um, that's a sobering thought. Right. <laughs> and, and making the challenge of, of trying to figure out how to, um, you know, how to enable that um, really quite, quite, quite difficult. Yeah. And um, especially mm -hmm. when um, in, in private industry, where much of this innovation, where the commercial right. applications necessarily happen, they're not going to wait 25 years. Right. Um, exactly. Usually you get a matter of months before filling out formal metric sheets for how exactly your innovations have contributed to the top line of the company. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's tough to do. And I think that, um, you know, a typical NIH grant is certainly not 25 years long. So, so I'm told. <laughs> All right. Um, thanks. That was, uh, that was great.
you know, so one, I mean, thinking about environments that we, uh, you know, we tend to fall back on and talk about um, one of those being Bell Labs is kind of the held as the pinnacle of, mm -hmm. of innovation. Um, and prompted by a, a colleague of mine, um, I read this short piece in the Financial Times by David uh, bon and, uh, Bodanis, I'm sorry, what companies can learn from a Cambridge physics laboratory. Um, and in that piece, um, uh, he spoke about mid-level abstraction. Uh, basically, um, you know, take care of the mechanics and give a little structure, but not too much, and grease the wheels and don't over-prescribe. And then get out of the way um, and, and let, you know, let this ground up discovery, um, you know, really flourish. So do you have any thoughts um, about that systems level uh, structure or management that, that, that is really conducive for catalyzing um, innovation? I thought that was a terrific article and I thank you for forwarding it to me because I had not thought of that precise term, mid-level innovation, but that really, really rings true. Um, so from both sort of good experience, productive experience, and from perhaps not as productive experience, no question that the environment makes, makes a big difference. And I would guess that, of course, the Cavendish lab was not about the pharmaceutical industry, but the, some of the same lessons really do apply. Um, mm -hmm. There's hard factors. Uh, you mentioned Bell Labs, you mentioned the Cavendish. These were both extraordinarily well resourced institutions. Um, so you just simply need to have the resources there. You need to have some investment. Uh, I think also a good sort of a hard factor in the environment is it, you enable collaboration. Again, it's, um, I think it's a myth, rather regrettably promulgated by the Nobel Prize, that one person or only a couple people is responsible right. for an innovation. Now, certainly I'm not that smart. Um, maybe other people are, but I just, the ones what I have seen is usually the painstaking work of many, many, many people, often working without even knowing uh, that their, their work will lead to something and usually unrecognized. And I, I, for one, am happy with that. This is not why, why we're in the business, but you have to collaborate. Um, each of us has our own perspectives. We each have our own expertises. And the, day, the days when da Vinci could do a painting and be brilliant there and be brilliant in science, again, I just don't see them anymore. Um, so probably that's another big one is collaboration. And you, you touched another, on another factor that I think is so important because I've seen uh, how it hurts when you don't have it is stability. Stability for some mission whether it's the Cavendish saying, we want to discover the structure of the atom, or whether it's Cambridge Laboratories saying, we would like to go after the structure of DNA. You have to have stable strategy, stable mission, and usually stable people, because it's extraordinary what we think is part of an institution. And then when a key person or key people leave or go on to other opportunities, it's just lost. It's very, very hard to replicate that. So those are sort of the hard factors. And then I really truly wish that I had been able to see some of the environment around the Cavendish or around Bell Laboratories because then you could really sort of test what I see today is that the softer factors usually are even more important. Um, really good people can find their way around almost any structure, but you have to have sort of a culture of honesty where people say, this didn't work and I have no idea why. And yes, it's true. That means for the past two years, I've been working on something that didn't pan out. Nobody likes to say it, but um, you, you just simply have to have it. And innovation, as, as we touched on earlier, by definition, you're trying to create something new. And um, that means, uh, as, as my first postdoctoral advisor, Bruce Bean, always told me that um, if it was obvious, somebody would have already done it. And so this means you cannot be afraid to fail. And when you put, when you're in a position where, whether it's a grant renewal or whether it's a milestone in a pharma company or perhaps a software release, um, if you're going to release your software on February 1st, you're going to release it. It may or may not actually work, but it will be released. So 
I shouldn't say fear of failure, that makes it a negative, but you have to have sort of this culture of honesty and openness where there are not, now, if you fail 10 years in a row, then you should probably look at what you're doing. Are you working in the right place with the right, with the right people, with the right tools? But some failure is just part of it. To produce good ideas, you have to have bad ideas. Thank you. Um, Chris. <clears throat> this is, we're really, this is really great stuff and we really appreciate you uh, taking the time for this. Um, there's a, there's a phrase that actually we've been throwing around called failing smart. <laughs> mm. right? mm -hmm. it, seems, it seems like there might be uh, ways to reward the right kind of failure in organizations. So to an, an, it actually build in rewards maybe to the organization to encourage failure that would be instructive or encourage failure that means people are trying things that are orthogonal. You know, it, it's absolutely exactly of, uh, betting, betting on companies. You need to bet on companies that will fail or you'd never get one that's a big winner or something. Is mm -hmm. that does that ring true? Absolutely. It? And, and it's, it's so hard to actually implement because you can have numerous awards, numerous say, okay, a goal is to fail quickly. So you don't spend too much time yes. in it, reach a go, no go quickly. And yet everybody wants to succeed. Um, but you're right. Uh, very often, especially in the realm in which I operate a clinical trial, you can learn tremendous amounts from a clinical trial, even though it is deemed a failure and uh, the investment is never recouped. Uh, there's still a lot of knowledge to be gained if that knowledge can be shared. Again, back to Bell Labs, um, my impression was that at that time, although it was a private institution, there was sort of the expectation that Bell would, would release the results or at least make them public in terms of competition. I don't know if that's the case anymore. Um, I would think certainly much less so whereby you have, there, there is much more of a sense that you can profit off of innovation. And so naturally people are, are, are keeping it a little tighter responding to those. But yes, um, failure can be, there, there's, there's successful failure and then there's abject failure. Um. <laughs> <laughs> failure, failure and successful failure, I think are good modifiers for that. Right, um, right, right. One question that, that was put in by the audience that I think it, it, it fits into what you were talking about, about what could be the constraints of the timeline of industry. Talk to us about academia. Like how, how, how can these two different kind of cultures intersect and kind of weave together or, or do they, or, and is that, there's a sense in academia at least that that's a rapidly evolving, <laughs> there's rapidly evolving rules around that relationship. I think no question, yes, and uh, they are moving together. And this is for, for a couple regions, reasons, all of them very good, all of them converging on useful answers. Um, I think every, every academic I've ever spoken to wants their discoveries and their thoughts to make a difference. And especially in the area of neuroscience neurology, usually that means improved treatments for, for neurological disease or prevention for neurological disease. Um, so, and this, the mechanism for doing this is through private capitalization or through, you know, public sector company, public sector for-profit company that can do that. That's just the me means by which we do this with some, some, some quite rare exceptions. And then from the other way, um, everybody in the industry would like to make first in class breakthrough drugs. So brand label drugs, new mechanisms addressing totally untreated medical need that's really, really tough to do. And the scientific substrate that you have to draw in the industry cannot be replicated within a pharmaceutical company. It's not what we're terribly good at. It's just not what we're best set up to do. So I think you have the very natural need for, on one side, the need for innovative ideas and new technologies. And on the other side, the desire to see the, the basic discoveries actually bear fruition that no question are coming closer together. Even just in my, in my comparatively short time in industry, 15, 16 years, um, no question, it's, 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 it's come together much, much closer. And there is now much more recognition, at least from the world in which I sit, that these discoveries that we, we very seldom will fund a sort of basic infrastructure, but we may have precise applied questions we need to ask that can really be best answered with the expert, those who invented them, whatever scientist, whatever it is that she or he is working on. 
and there is recognition that this is not a space for intellectual property, not a space to, to, to let that be prohibited from a good partnership. So I think actually that's, that's been one of the really big and helpful developments that I've seen helpful from the standpoint of society as a whole. Staying with you, Chris. Yeah, sure. So I, I mean, the list of questions we have is nearly endless, but one, <laughs> one that I think is, there's really interesting science around um, innovation. And one of, one of the interesting findings that's coming out that it sometimes could be in, um, that, that's pretty unambiguous is that more diverse environments uh, where diversity is defined a lot of ways, including culturally, like not culture of science, even just culturally, um, tend to produce what are by different metrics deemed more innovative ideas and more impactful papers, at least if you're using the metrics of traditional academic bean counting, <laughs> uh, that, you know, that often diversity is a really big driver. How, again, that, but there's a tension around that, you know, especially around the softer uh, skills questions that come up about how do you keep an environment with lots of people that are from all different kinds of, say, cult different scientific pursuits. They might not even know the scientific terms of someone else in a different mm -hmm. discipline. So how do you, how do you, <laughs> is there a way to solve that? Do you, is there a, is there a strategy that you've encountered that would fit with that? Um, first, I will agree wholeheartedly. Um, it's amazing once you sort of start looking for this, for examples, how often they come up, because exactly as you said, uh, each one of us is shaped by our own perspectives and our own life experience. And no question, many factors are part of that. It might be your particular education, where you've lived, it might be cultural factors. And yes, where, where you bring different viewpoints, um, this can be very, very powerful. And um, I think, how do you actually harness this? First, you be aware of it. And this takes proactive training. Um, I think some really terrific work uh, in companies, most notably in Amgen, which was my first industrial employer, uh, they had a very strong strategic HR presence, strategic human resources that looked into these issues, could quantify them. And most important, uh, when you were going to supervise somebody, you got this training. Um, so it was, it was good. It's a matter of this is not the sort of training, certainly, that, that many of us would have encountered, and it's perhaps not standard for a science and technical background. But nonetheless, um, this, is how, this is how you all come together. This is, this is a big part of it. So I think it can be done, and again, I think we're moving in the right direction. Um, it's, it's been good. I, I was amused. I, I met my good friend, Jeff Evelhoek, who's who was in imaging at Merck and then imaging at Amgen. And um, I'm 6'4", Jeff is 6'6", six, six, and we were the only two people in our management class who, who they said, as far as the profiles that you have filled out, um, you two fit as women of color. So um, these things are not absolute, but, uh, and again, I do not ascribe any particular set to one, that's, that's beyond me, but um, they're, 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 they're out there. And exactly as you said, it is a strength to capture, and if we can capture those. Stefan, there is actually um, a question from a high school student um, who's in Turkey. And I thought wow. it might be a great <laughs> um, moment to jump in and ask the question, um, which really has to do with, um, I think, linking to what you were just talking about, but also um, the, lo the longevity and the long-term process that is scientific discovery that we all <laughs> know um, and wish it was faster. Um, but they're asking about, um, you know, how should they think about uh, choosing projects and um, how, uh, how important is it uh, to have long-term funding for um, discovery and innovation, um, and should that be one of the metrics for picking, you know, a project, one that's got um, backed with a large amount of funding? Yeah. So, lot, so I think oh, it's an yeah. interesting question, right? It it's is. Like, there's there's is a lot in there. Is it the question that the most in terms of intellectual yeah. <laughs> desire and interest, or do I go with a project where I can see that there's a big chunk of money there? Um, that will keep the project going. 
I don't know the answer question. to that. That's a big life question. I would say that would be different for each individual person. Um, mm -hmm. I can tell you the answer it was for me is that um, I perhaps foolishly um, never worried so much about sort of where funding would come from. Um, what I had done was pick projects that were interesting and most important people that I really, really liked to work with. Yeah, and maybe the other um, thing that comes to mind for me is that we are, um, we typically look in the moment and say, where is the funding right now? And what projects, you know, are, um, yeah, gaining the most resources. Mm -hmm. But that's a little, um, you, you've got this moment in time and you really, you're looking at what happened five years ago in terms of the funding catching up with the ideas. And so one could argue that if you're um, just starting out in science, that's the moment to not follow the crowd and actually be really yeah. open about what yeah. you might pursue um, and uh, be ahead of the curve rather than looking at these trailing indicators of where um, you know, scientific advances are happening. So. Yes, you're right. I agree. Yeah. So I am um, going to uh, start to talk a little bit about um, the question about, um, you know, some of those diseases and disorders that really um, are of major concern right now. And we're in a acute healthcare crisis, but of course we are living a very chronic healthcare crisis with many um, disorders of the nervous system and the brain um, currently having very few um, effective therapies and similarly um, early diagnostics are um, also lacking. So, um, you know, you and I have spent, um, and you in particular, Stefan, because of the area you're in, you've spent a long time thinking about how to change the trajectory of many of these really devastating diseases that have massive societal impacts. And both you and I, um, you know, have seen our family members suffer, um, in my case, from addiction. Um, and in yours, Alzheimer's, and just really devastating, um, and feeling pretty un, un, um, unable to to do anything as scientists. And you know, how, how do you um, help? And really not seeing a, a path. Of course, um, you know. So is 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 the is the lack of new therapies um, because there is not sufficient innovation I and mean, we're talking about <laughs> how to have breakthroughs and um and breaking the rules right so um has there not been enough rule breaking in um thinking about therapy development for some of these really major disorders that we're um uh, we've just got to see a change in the trajectory yeah a really good question um, and no question, uh, some areas, these are the best days the world has ever seen for oncology. Uh, mm -hmm. No disrespect intended to those who suffer and die from cancer, but the treatments mm -hmm. that are available now, targeted therapies, better chemotherapies, and especially immune oncology therapies that harness the immune system to attack tumors, um, the, the, the needle is being moved. And not seeing that so far for neurological diseases. And this of course is a huge spectrum of diseases. Um, we named some of them at the beginning and, and we could go on. There are things here or there, it's not, it's not a desert, but fundamentally what we need is mechanistic understanding of these diseases um, and as to why. So there's sort of a meme in the field that neuroscience is hard. Well, everything's hard. So, mm -hmm. Why then is neuroscience to some extent in particular thinking of Alzheimer's? Why has this to some extent been refractory? I think you can make a case that this is a, uh, somewhat of a function of the resources that go into it. Um, and there's a reason that so much investment, and I don't even mean dollars, I mean um, research, so much research and so much engineering is going into oncology therapies. Uh, people demand them. Uh, the same thing for rare diseases, uh, for gene therapies, people demand them. It's, it's a very compelling 
case, uh, and it's of course a profound life experience if you have a child who has an inherited genetic disorder. And there are foundations, I deeply admire the work the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation did to catalyze that entire push that I talked about at the very first. And I think there is perhaps less of a push for neurological diseases due to the very nature of the disease. There is still some shame around them. There is still record, patients with chronic pain get told, well, it's all in your head. Well, yes, you have neurons that are firing abnormally. That shouldn't be, it's a, it's, it's a physical disease. And even more important than that, you mentioned addiction, uh, you mentioned dementia. Patients with these syndromes are not in a case to advocate for themselves. And I think if you, of course, it's again, it's not a desert, I'm oversimplifying, but I do wanna draw the distinction that in many cases, these diseases leave the patients and leave their caregivers um, with no opportunity to, uh, to advocate for their cause as well as perhaps some of the other disorders. And that makes a difference in terms of where the research dollars go. I shouldn't say dollars, it's really an investment that counts where the research investment goes and, and what people work on. So I would like to think that greater mechanistic understanding of the diseases, exactly as you mentioned, for prognostic markers, how do we tell who is about to get a disease so that we can perhaps try to prevent it, that is going to take more work. Mm -hmm. um, there are actually a couple of connected questions from the audience and they're, they're somewhat different, but um, you know, early on, um, someone asked about um, some of the innovations that, that, asking about some of the innovations that you may have seen in the area of chronic pain and you mentioned this, um, you know, as a, as a real critical un, uh, area of unmet need. And so could you perhaps just mention um, what you know about in that area? And the second part, which is slightly different, is we, um, we should also talk about what, what we are, what we mean by rule, what you mean by rule breaking. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and, and perhaps uh, spend a little bit of time on examples of that too. But mm -hmm. to the first, to the first question um, about chronic pain and what have you seen mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. is particularly innovative uh, in this area? So for chronic pain, um, a couple of the innovations that we hope are going to come through and reach patients are based on, on human biology. Uh, in particular, I'm thinking of a class of molecules called nerve growth factor inhibitors, um, antibody to nerve growth factor that uh, certainly looks very, very good as an injectable therapy for pain um, that we hope is going to help help many patients. Um, and that originally came from a quite rare genetic disorder um, called um, SIPA, congenital insensitivity to, insensitivity, uh, insensitivity to pain with anhydrosis. Um, and in sort of studying the molecular basis of that, you could say, okay, this is how the body um, these are some things, mutations, that make the body unable to experience pain quite so acutely. Once you have that, again, going back to the cystic fibrosis example, if you know exactly what causes the disease, then your challenge for making a new therapeutic turns into being an engineering challenge and not a biological challenge. To our last question, this is where we hope that we might be able to get to Alzheimer's, in that if we know what causes the disease, then we can probably make an intervention. Um, another one uh, that, that uh, I, I've worked on is again from a rare genetic um, condition, um, congenital indifference to pain. And again, the key here is not so much that the patients are unable to sense pain, but they are neurologically otherwise almost completely normal with the exception of sense of smell. And again, uh, it turns out to be a fiendish engineering challenge to actually make this such a therapy. I infer this because, again, this was first discovered 15 years ago. Um, but there, there are some cracks showing, and I, I, I do have some hopes. And finally, for pain, again, um, there's no question that the opioid crisis has made people realize to some extent the uh, need, the unmet need for therapies. So I would, I, I would hope that we would see some things and then sort of iterations on these. Pain is fundamentally, perhaps to first approximation, an excitability disorder. You could draw the distinction with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or neurodegeneration where the neurons are dying. How do you bring back a dead neuron? 
that's a very, very different challenge from trying to say, you've got a neuron that is spiking abnormally. How do you quiet that abnormal spiking? So it's, it's an active area. It's one where we can hope to see some new therapies. And in addition to this, uh, consider also the behavioral therapies. Just simply people are, are, are looking at this more. Oh, migraine. There have been um, three or four new drugs of the same class that came out as prophylactics for migraine mm -hmm. within the past couple of years. And this, again, is an entirely different way of looking at it. Instead of waiting till you have a migraine, then take a pill, you have an injection that in clinical trials decreases the number of migraines you see per month. So um, I, I think very hopeful. Great. Um, so what about rule breaking, Stefan? Oh, <laughs> I do not endorse it. <laughs> do not jaywalk. <laughs> Please comport with the advice of state and local authorities in wearing a mask uh, right now. So I don't, I don't mean literally breaking the rules. I think it's more perhaps that if there is a dogma that prevails, know where it comes from. Now, many dogmas, especially in science, and I use the scientific meaning of dogma, are there for very good reason. But I think you can probably learn the most where you have really strong data, robust data, reliable data that go against the dogma. And um, it's always, I, I, I had myself a genetic pedigree just within the past couple months where we were turning up something that I thought was quite extraordinary and quite relevant to human health. But we just said, well, this is not how genetics works. It can't be. And then I thought, no, we keep trying to knock these data down and we're just not able to knock them down. So perhaps this adds to how we're working to, to how genetics, the actual pattern of heritability can appear within a pedigree and can appear across pedigrees. So that's really more what I mean. I mean, mm -hmm. um, if the textbook is telling you um, DNA replication is semi-conservative, now we know that's true, of course. That being said, if you had some really, really robust data saying that there were alternative forms going on, which of course now we know there are many sort of gradations to this um, and exceptions to it, um, I don't know. I guess I'm saying if the data don't match the theory, adjust the theory, not Absolutely. the data. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I'd actually like to like to jump in on this. I really agree with you. I think there's a there's a notion in discovery in science, at least, that <clears throat> I uh, have to have a sort of a wildly original streak. But if you don't understand what the dogma is, you can't understand what variation from it would be and therefore how you're making a contribution. So there's a tension that you, you actually have to, if, if you want to be, the, the capacity for being evaded probably correlates with the capacity which you understand what most people think about certain topics. Um, because you have to know what a delta would be, right, from that topic. Um, and so how you do that without becoming brainwashed into agreeing mm -hmm, with mm -hmm, the dogma mm -hmm. on the topic is, is, is an important educational question, but uh, maybe yep. a little different. Yeah. And then there's this part of which I think we all recognize you spend years and years working on a particular hypothesis and it becomes a very personal <laughs> mm -hmm. thing when, you know, there are data there and just inconsistent and and that's where the you know that's where the discoveries are but you really there's this personal characteristic which is i've been working on this for a very long time and i want this to be true i want this to be i want my hypothesis to to be borne out but that that's really when you have to fight um and that's really when you open your eyes and you see the data that you're just not expecting and that's mm -hmm. exciting that mm -hmm. that's really mm -hmm. exciting because mm -hmm. we're not very good at predicting the future but keeping your eyes open and as Chris said, to really understand, um, you know, what is the underlying, um, you know, set of data and the idea within a field. Because if you don't have that anchor, then it's very difficult to, to see deviation. Yeah. Um, I wonder um, just to, makes me think about, you know, as educators as well, you know, at Brown and you teach Stefan um, here at Brown as well. And, but you've also been an undergrad, like a receiver of an incredibly privileged education here, mm -hmm. albeit a few years ago, not to <laughs> eat you, <laughs> more recent than, than, than me. Um, but I wonder if you, you know, could you 
perhaps reflect a bit on your undergraduate experience at Brown. Did that, you know, is there something about that with the characteristics or collaborations? Um, was that was that educational experience somewhat foundational in the way you approach your science now? Um, and is there I anything think, that yeah. you think you know? I would. I we need to improve on, or you think about when you're teaching um, drug discovery to the undergraduates here. Yes, um, you were right. I was very, very privileged and very lucky, and uh, I'm still quite grateful to my parents and to the United States Navy for funding that uh, <laughs> education. <laughs> um, and no question, um, some of this, I think what does distinguish, there, there's a couple things that distinguish Brown, um, a core of absolute academic excellence um, as reflected in the scholarship of the faculty and in the quality of the instruction. Um, I sort of took it for granted that, that professors would be engaged in really caring about communicating what they did. And that's something very, very admirable that, that uh, I think is very special about Brown. I think um, no question the curriculum does force you to think in sometimes, a, sometimes an uncomfortable process, not just what am I doing, but why am I doing this? Where do I want to go and how do I get there? And that's, it's sort of a softer metric, but it really does put the initiative on the student and the responsibility to learn, I think, a lesson that takes you very, very well, wherever you, serves you well, wherever you go in life. Um, what do I actually want to do with this? Where do I want to go with my own thoughts and my own development? And then puts the responsibility on the student to actually put together a plan to get there. This is what helped me when I first went to grad school. It was for applied physics at Caltech. Um, and I really wasn't very good at it. Um, and I really didn't like it very much. And so it was a very natural extension of the undergraduate training I just completed to say, why then am I doing this? When what I really enjoyed was working with Anita Zimmerman in the pharmacology department at Brown and sitting at a patch clamp rig and learning about ion channels. And that's what I did. So I would say yes, in a very uh, personal way, it affected me. And um, uh, it's, it's, it's a real pleasure to be even a small part of that continuing tradition. That sounds like a little rule breaking as well, just in the sense of like not following <laughs> what would have been the standard path. The, yes, the, yeah. yes. Uh, I think so. It's again, it's not so, it's not a matter of uh, um, people have set rules for society and you're going to break them for their own sake. It's no, recognizing no. this is, this is what serves, this, this is what serves me the best. This is what I want to do. Chris? I was going to, one of the questions from the audience, you brought mm -hmm. up the making of the atomic bomb, which is just a fabulous book if you want to embrace this. Are, are there other books on innovation or on discovery or about discovery that you'd recommend for people? Good question. Um, shoot, I'm sure as soon as we end this call, I'll be able to think of about 10. Um, I'll, I'll give you one recommendation that's a little apart. Going back again to the previous question to the value of the Brown education, um, I think including for science and engineering majors, what really differentiates is the liberal arts component. And that leads to analytical independent thinking and sort of independent awareness. And so for this matter, one of my favorite books is called My Traitor's Heart. The author is Rian Malan, who's a South African. And it's his experience as a journalist growing up in what was then apartheid South Africa and coming to terms with some of the contradictions in there. So uh, I, that's, yeah, uh, I, will, I will stop there. Um, as <laughs> Dr. Lipscomb mentioned in her introduction, I do, I do love books and I love rare books. Yeah. And I could go on for easily an hour, but I'll spare you and just, okay. just give the one. That's good. So um, we are getting close to the hour, <laughs> but I, um, I'm going to come back to, um, you know, what, you know, where does innovation come from? And um, I'm being fed from 
the audience again, thank you everyone out there for sending in the questions. Um, so uh, this uh, is really, um, you know, many of us certainly um, feel that innovation comes via disruption. I think again, this is, that could have been the title <laughs> of this presentation as well. Um, but the question is, uh, is, is suggesting that the pharmaceutical industry is pretty much anchored in traditional processes. Um, but potentially have the resources to promote disruption. So do you see um, this perhaps happening in bug pharma um, down the road that, that the, the process might change or, and how might that I think, yes, forward? it is changing. Um, mm -hmm. Every, every institution's reputation is probably five to 10 years behind where it really is. And um, pharma has, has changed rapidly. I'm not gonna go for a, a line by line uh, uh, itemization or defense, but there are some real examples. Um, for here, I'll use Novartis's new therapy for uh, spinal muscular atrophy, absolutely devastating condition. And again, we can hope that this, uh, uh, this, this may someday just be treatable, be a, a treatable lasting condition. And that, uh, if you go through sort of how, to, how, how actually this therapy was discovered, um, it's quite daring. Uh, it's the sort of thing that could only really have been done, I think, with um, a good tolerance for failure. So a called, so-called sort of phenotypic screen where you try to replicate your disease in a dish and without even necessarily knowing the target, just test molecule after molecule after molecule after molecule. Now that can, can be very good, can have a lot of sense, but you've got to be absolutely confident that your cellular assay at the base of a single cell actually reflects disease in human. And um, so uh, then of course you have, you have a lot of quite innovative stuff coming out in the gene therapy front, CAR T cells. Um, this is another one who would think of actually taking people's cells and reprogramming them. And this now is, this, this now is I, I don't say sort of first line therapy, but it is certainly available as an option. So I think it, it's turning. Um, mm -hmm. What a big pharma uh, or big biopharma is probably more accurate. Uh, what we really excel at is once sort of, once, once the, the goalposts are set, um, I'm going to mix my sports metaphors. Shoot, you either kick a ball through it or slam dunk it or put it the puck into it or something. Whatever the. <laughs> Sorry, what, what, once the I once mean... the you can tell I'm 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 a straight baseball man. Um, what we really do well is execute, but more and more we are going into these earlier discovery stages, and especially the smaller companies, conversely, that can be set up well around a, a, a single idea with a custom built team, they may not have the best resources once they've done proof of concept to actually get something into the shape where it can be given mm -hmm. to patients. Yeah. So no question, um, in, as with in any big organization, if you say no, you're going to be right 99% of the time, but you're still going to fail. So um, if, you, right. if, you, if you always say no, so the question is, how do you actually pick the winners out there? And that itself is its own skill too. Yeah. So I think, uh, uh, I, I think actually it's a rather hopeful case. It's an encouraging mm -hmm. case. I mean, one of the things that Chris brought up and maybe we can kind of circle back to some of those earlier comments um, and it was raised by someone posing a question about the fact that, you know, it, the pharma world and certainly in industry, um, there's just this tremendous advantage of being able to collaborate ac across different disciplines. And, mm -hmm. and that's just done extraordinarily well, like that, that team approach to taking on um, really gnarly problems and um, perhaps something that we're not quite as good as in academia because, because of historical reasons. But certainly I think um, where we can do that, there we just, benefit hugely. Mm -hmm. So perhaps that is something that we can um, borrow um, and learn from that, that is done particularly well um, 
you know, in the pharmaceutical mm -hmm. um, industry. Do you have any final thoughts about that? Maybe yes. We'll uh, going back to collaboration, mm -hmm. collaboration is is very important. Um, it's using the unique expertise and the unique experience that everybody brings to the table towards a common goal. And uh, some of the many of the innovative areas that we've discussed here that have been real successes have done exactly that. So the more communication you can catalyze, the more you can get to where people actually need to do this, want to do this, are set up to do this in their goals. Um, I think I think the better. Mm -hmm. And if you were going back in time to to um, start your PhD, Stefan, what would you tell yourself about how you should um, prepare yourself to be an innovator? Um, one thing that I would tell myself is um, don't drop the immunology course just because you're not getting it. <laughs> <laughs> um, foundation of hard science. I think there are no shortcuts, um, and especially in, uh, in rigor, and that um, the thing to aim for is not, now I've, I've learned this from my mentors, from my advisors, but that the thing to aim for is not sort of a splashy paper. It's to really do deep, thorough work that um, is, is going to be something lasting. So I think with the advice of my mentors, I think I was able to do some of that in collaboration with them. But had I been going back to when I was just starting my PhD, that would have been a good, a good thing to come in starting. Um, don't worry about sort of, you know, personal achievement or recognition or whatever. It just surprising how little it matters to me now. Chris, what do you think? Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm not sure what it, what advice I would give, but I, I wanted to echo the, you know, you're referencing one of the questions uh, that came in from the audience was about the real need if you're going to collaborate, the just raw communication skills. And you were talking about the liberal arts education at Brown. Um, and that felt very, uh, that, that felt like a really crucial skill in terms of being an innovator is <clears throat> training and both in writing and in speaking and your ability to, to just to be able to talk to somebody with a very different point of view so that you can make mm -hmm. that connection. Is that, you know, is there a training we could give scientists or a kind of way we can push them to, or, or generalists, or is there something we can do to help achieve that? I'll chime in. I think that's incredibly important. And one of the aphorisms I use is if you can't explain your work or why it's important, nobody, it, it will have no impact. And part of talking in the, in, of working in teams is you very seldom are talking to people who are really that well-versed technically in what you, in what you yourself do. So you just simply have to learn to communicate. Um, and it's not, it's not even a matter of, of, formal scientific communication, it's how to communicate with somebody who doesn't have the same background, you may have the same goals, but it takes time, it takes patience, and um, it takes willingness to enjoy it. Well, thank you. Um, thank I'm you. I'm just going to say a few quick wrap up words and then talk about the next um, Carnian conversations. But first, of course, Stefan, this was great. Um, delighted to be in conversation with you and with Chris. Um, very stimulating. I mean, maybe as you were talking, I was actually thinking about, um, you know, what it takes to trigger an action potential, <laughs> come back to brain science and everyone stares at that beautiful action potential, but there's all these ions that, that we're, we're helping get to the threshold and without them, um, there would be no action potential. And I think so incredibly, important to understand that everything is adding to that one huge event, but without those incremental, I don't want to say science is incremental, but without those, those ground, um, uh, those grounding events and the, the, the addition of each new discovery along the way, you're never going to hit, hit that point. So I think there's an analogous there and it can take a long time. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I do want to um, 
you know, again, thank you for this and thank the audience for their questions. This was um, very stimulating and a discussion that we're all going to continue because um, this is, of course, really critically important um, as we think about making an impact and really changing the trajectory of, of some of the most devastating disorders that, that we face as a society. Um, next week, uh, we're going to um, have Professor uh, Bea Luna, who's the Staunton Professor of Psychiatry and Pediatrics and Professor of Psychology at the University of Pittsburgh, in conversation with us on May 12th at 3.30 um, to talk about um, the adolescent brain. And if there's ever a mystery in brain science, it's that. <laughs> uh, perhaps more akin to chaos theory. But, you know, what is going on in the adolescent brain? And the title of, of her presentation is, What Are They Thinking? Decision Making and the Adolescent Brain. So see you next week. Thank you everyone for being here and participating. <laughs>